We're back. Okay, almost two, almost time, two more minutes. Okay, Thomas Cannell is here. I saw you at the other link and glad to see you coming back here. So let me see, I should start sharing a screen. <clears throat> let me see. And then I should start my PPT, which is this one over here, which is not the correct one. Uh, let me find the correct one. This is the correct PPT. Okay, let's get started. Um, hello, everybody. Can you guys turn on your camera so that I don't feel like lecturing to an empty room? It's much better if you turn on your camera so that I can see your continents. And it's a lot better than just lecturing to a group of uh, names. Okay, Sophie is on. You are Huawu. Can you turn on your camera? Jahbi, Jahbi bin Jahangir, Muna Awanja. Guess. Yeah, I see Anthony Zulo, David Sawonki, Miri Marinova. 
Geoffrey Sanchez, Yu Hen Chen, good. So it feels much better seeing your faces. Um, so today I'm going to lecture on the quantum theory, theory of light, okay? Um, I have some problem here. Um, my screen sharing went away. Where did it go? Does, any know, does anybody know how to recover the screen sharing? You seem to still be sharing your screen from what I can tell. It's just showing your desktop. You can see my screen? Yes. Can, can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, good. So I have to move this piece of things away. Let me see. Move it to the corner here, maybe. Okay, today I'm gonna to lecture on the quantum theory of light, which I feel is a very important topic and also very exciting. It is very rich in terms of content. So I will have to go fast. Otherwise I cannot cover the ground that I need to cover. Um, so in order for me to go fast, I will not write out the transparencies or slides, but I have pre-prepared slides to walk you through the topics. And then you can read the lecture notes for details. There are lots of things to learn here because um, Quantum theory of light has to be learned in several lectures. So I start with all these topics, okay? Maybe most importantly, the Hamiltonian theory of a pendulum and walk through you through these topics and so on. So why are we so interested in the quantum theory of light? It started out as being a quantum theory of light, which was later known as quantum optics but quantum optics has slowly dropped in frequencies so low that you are also looking into microwave photons. Microwave photons are very weak. And so I shouldn't call this just uh, quantum optics, but I will call it quantum electromagnetics. For instance, the most recent quantum computers that we have uh, is actually built with microwave photons rather than optical photons and optical photons are um, a lot easier to measure. So the progress is rapid. We have quantum communications, uh, which give you security and encryption. If you have quantum computers, we have quantum parallelism, something never achievable before. And if you do quantum sensing, like quantum radar, uh, quantum biomedical application, you can have enhanced sensitivity. And these are going to be transformative technologies that nobody can achieve before without quantum technology. So I like to start with the quantum theory of a simple pendulum. So before I start with the quantum theory of a simple pendulum, I will go with the Hamiltonian theory of a pendulum. I think most of you know how to derive the equations of motion for a pendulum and you did that in high school and you found that the equation of motion is given by this one over here. This we can derive by using Newton's law. However, you can also arrive at this equation using Hamiltonian theory where you invoke energy conservation. For instance, the Hamiltonian of a system is equal to its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. For the case of the pendulum, the kinetic energy is given by the momentum squared divided by 2m. The potential energy is very much proportional to its displacement 
So we're actually using a linear theory here that the force is proportional to displacement and then the potential energy hence is proportional to the displacement square. And now if you invoke the fact that um, the P, which are the variables, X is also the other variable. They are supposed to be varying with respect to time. And if we vary P and X, which are position and momentum in such a way that this thing remains a constant, which is the Hamiltonian, you can go through your calculus and show that if this thing is going to vary via P and X, they have to vary via P and X via this equation, but they cannot make the total H change. So these two terms must cancel each other by requiring that these two terms cancel each other, you get this equation of motion. The change in the momentum is the change in the Hamiltonian with respect to position. And then the change in the position, which is the velocity is equal to the change of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momentum, okay? These are called the Hamilton equations. And from these Hamilton equations, you can actually convert them back to this equation because H is equal to this. So if you take H and differentiate with respect to X, remember X and P are independent variables. So when you differentiate with respect to X, you're supposed to keep P constant. And if you differentiate this, you get this one. And the next thing you do is to take this Hamiltonian and change only P and keep X a constant. And if you do that, you get this term on the right-hand side and we combine these two terms, you get the usual equation of motion for a pendulum, which is arrived at by energy conservation argument. So what is more important is that a classical pendulum theory or Hamiltonian theory, which is classical, is not of great interest because we actually want to figure out what the quantum theory is. So again, uh, it was first put forth by Schrodinger. And he started out with this Hamiltonian, which is a classical quantity. That the, the Hamiltonian can be written in this fashion. And he was motivated by a few things, one of which is Planck's uh, law, that the energy of the system is proportional to h bar omega. And Planck observed that from the energy of the photons. And then we broadly, a Frenchman also hypothesized that the momentum of a particle is proportional to h bar times k. Okay, if you have a wave describing an electron, for instance, the wavelength would be given by this figure over here. And that is somewhat related to momentum. And Schrodinger converts it, uh, this equation that we have from the left to that on the right, motivated by all this observations, experimental finding it is a very wonderful and powerful guessing game. Nobody would have imagined that they are related. So the next thing that uh, Schrodinger did was to realize that uh, K or H bar K can be also written as H bar partial partial X. If the thing that it is acting on is a wave function. Okay, so you can replace H square K square with P hat partial partial X square and replace this with a plane wave, for instance. And if you do that, then you have what is known as the Schrodinger equation. And it's a very easy equation to solve by separation of variables, because the time dependence is so simple. So you can actually get rid of the time dependence by just doing this, as we have often done in electromagnetics. So then this becomes an equation independent of time, okay, which is the Schrodinger equation for sta uh, stationary states. Okay? It turns out that this equation has closed form, even though this is quadratic, it has closed form. And those closed forms are given by hermit gaussian polynomials. And these closed forms are called the photon number states or the Fox states. And the eigenvalue also has closed forms. And actually you can fish out the closed forms. Actually they were done in the 1800s, way before Schrodinger, Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger did his work in 1927 about. Okay, you can fish out all these special functions. Uh, and the one with n equal to zero, 
will be the one with the lowest energy state. And that function will look something like this. And this function is orthonormal because the eigenstates of a linear operator, we learned many times over that if you have a linear operator equation, all the eigenvectors are orthogonal, you can normalize them to make them uh, orthogonal, orthonormal, okay? However, this area is replete with notational changes. You have to be familiar with all these changes in notation as you go from one community of scholars to another one. For instance, this is how we write a photon number state in the explicit notation, they call it. The mathematician will drop the x and then just call this a size of n. They call this a vector. The function is a vector. The physicist will call this a cat. Okay, this uh, the same concept. This is a vector, so I can write a vector as a cat. And then physicists are very terse. They say all these sides are superfluous. Why do I just write the cat in this manner? Okay, so you have to understand this uh, change of community of scholars uh, using different notations. So these solutions have closed form solutions. Now this equation, Schrodinger equation, has closed form solution. Uh, you can download from wiki and then these are the photon number states. You can actually look at this photon number states for different ends and they all look something like this, of course, with the time dependence removed. Okay, if you put in the time dependence, they will look something like that. But these are what uh, physicists call stationary states. The lowest energy state is a ground state, which is the one at the bottom. It looks like a Gaussian, it just looks something like this. And then what happens is that we're going to relate this pendulum in, with the harmonic oscillator of electromagnetics. We are going to claim that the time harmonic oscillation of electromagnetics is homomorphic to a pendulum. Whatever quantum properties that we can see from a pendulum, we can also see in the time harmonic oscillation of an electromagnetic field. Okay, so that is very important. And as you can see, this time harmonic oscillations have different energy states. Okay, at the lowest level, the energy level is very low as indicated by this equation over here. And that point is actually called a zero point energy when there's no photons. Okay, and if you count this energy level, they're all separated by photons, photon energy level. So they have, something to do with the fact that every time a photon is absorbed by the quantum pendulum or quantum oscillation, the energy level jumps by one to the next level up. And these oscillations are going to be uh, going higher and higher up and so on. And so as you go to higher energy level, you have more oscillations, very much like what you notice in the waveguide mode or cavity mode in the electromagnetic cavity, okay? And so Schrodinger equation is very important for a study. Uh, we look at it this way and we can think of this as an operator. And this operator, we will call it H hat, which is the Hamiltonian operator. And this equation is too ugly for many mathematicians and physicists. We like to beautify it. So we did the change of variable and work with this dimensionless quantity C. And then if we work with this dimensionless quantity, this equation can be written uh, more beautifully in this manner. X square becomes C square, partial partial X square becomes partial partial C square. And let me call all these functions of C now instead of X. And furthermore, this function looks like A square minus B square kind of thing. Okay, it's like a squared minus b squared. So it inspires a kind of factorization that maybe you can factorize this. In fact, you can factorize it. You can factorize it to look like this, where your a dagger and a are these two definitions. You can back substitute very easily to show that if you substitute a dagger and a into this equation, you get back the previous equation. But this equation is a lot more compact and beautiful in the opinion of many people. Uh, these are called the annihilation operator, whereas, the, sorry, this is called the creation operator, whereas this is called the annihilation operator. 
Um, so you can plug this back to Schrodinger equation, obtain a very compact form. And Schrodinger equation can be written in this very compact form now. Uh, this equation has closed form in a formal way because Hamiltonian H hat is supposed to be a constant because it's supposed to represent the total energy of the system. It is not supposed to change with time. These things can change with time, but in total, this thing cannot change with time. So this gives you an equation where H hat and operator, just remember that an operator is nothing but a matrix operator with infinite dimensional uh, dimensions. And so think of this as a matrix operator and so on. And if you have taken a course in control theory and think of phi as a vector, and if you're a good control theorist, you will very quickly realize that this operator equation is very similar to what you call the state equation in control theory. It has a closed form solution where this is a matrix operator. And if you're in control theory, you know how to take care of this. Exponentiation of a matrix operator is often done in control theory. I wouldn't be labeled that, but you can read up your control theory book and figure out how to take the exponential of an operator. But since all this are known in closed form, and size of n is also known in closed form, as we shown before, they are written in terms of Hermit Gaussian polynomials. You can actually convince yourself that if you were to operate this operator on a photon number state, you actually get the lower photon number state. And if you were to use the creation operator or the uh, A dagger and operate it on the photon number state, you get a higher photon number state. And this photon number state means that the n plus one photons vary in the oscillation. This means only n photons vary in the oscillation. That's why this is called a lowering operator, whereas this is called a raising operator. You can look at this in close form, it looks something like this, and we actually did sketcher of this, uh, sketches of this for you. And the lowest energy state is this one. Okay, it just looks like a simple Gaussian. And if you do the lowering operator or the annihilation operator on the ground state, you always get zero. You can prove to yourself quite easily by direct substitution. And also there is an operator called a number operator. When you can compare this equation, you can see that if you take n hat to be a dagger a, which is this term over here, okay? You can show that when this operates on the photon number state, you just get n back. That's why you have eigenvalue as being equal to uh, n plus half, which I showed in the previous slide, for instance. Okay, the eigenvalues are n plus half because uh, the number operator has eigenvalues of n. Okay, these are details in the mathematics it would be very confusing for you to think about in the beginning. I believe that you actually have to sit down and think and study this area in great detail before the knowledge would sink in. Okay, I encourage you that after this lecture, you go back and read the lecture notes and let this knowledge sink in. It's in a sense, a lot more difficult than classical electromagnetic theory, okay, but it's important. So let's talk about some salient features of quantum theory. So we have electromagnetic fields. Classically, we know that if you have a cavity resonator, if you have a pendulum, we have sinusoidal oscillations or time harmonic oscillations. What happens is that in the quantum world, the position and the momentum of a particle, in this case, the pendulum, the position and the momentum are random variables. Those are called observables. X and P are called observables because you can measure them in the laboratory. Since they are random variables, if you were to make a sinusoidal signal in the quantum wall, it will not look like a pure sinusoid, but a sinusoidal function with some standard deviation of fuzziness to it. Okay, and so the position of a particle or the pendulum is never precisely known, and it's actually a random variable. Uh, so we have to define some kind of a probability density function to describe the randomness of this position, and that uh, probability density function is given by psi square. And since this is a PDF of 
probability density function. Uh, it has to be normalized. It has to uh, normal. That is, if you integrate the area of this PDF or probability density function, it has to be one. And then this is just, as we have learned in this course, an inner product notation. And if you use direct, uh, direct notation, we can actually write this inner product between two vectors in this manner. And if we use matrix notation, then we can think of this psi as a vector. And then the other one is this conjugate transpose. In direct notation, conjugate transpose is always implied. This is a transpose of this vector, but it's always implied to be the conjugate, uh, conjugate transpose. Whereas in linear algebra, it's not implied. So we have to put it explicitly. Actually, I like linear algebra notation better than direct notation, okay? Because sometimes you do have to put these things explicitly. So if you were to take the average of a variable like x, and because this is a probability density function, the average of x will be given by this expression, and you can write it in this manner. And you can also new, use the notation x bar being the average of x. And you can also use the fact that uh, this actually is an integral. So it's like an inner product integral, but with an operator x sandwiched in between the two functions, we can call that operator x hat. And this is direct notation for finding the expectation value of the operator x hat. And this is matrix notation or linear algebra notation for finding the expectation value of this operator x. In matrix notation, a bold face with an over bar is a matrix in my notation. So a bold face alone is a vector. So this is a vector times a matrix times a vector. And that if you're very good in control theory, that is just the expectation value of this operator x and so on. So is some, something more interesting than that is that not only x is an operator, you can also describe the momentum p as an operator, as we have seen. The p hat is described by this operator over here. And this operator also has an average or expectation value. And in linear algebra, to find the expectation uh, value of a matrix p, you just go through this. But in quantum theory, you go through this inner product and if you work it out properly, uh, that expectation value is calculated using this indirect notation, okay? Any questions so far? If not, let's move on. So what is the most important thing when you go from a classical world to the random world? In the classical world, something is deterministic, but in the quantum world, that deterministic quantity, which is called the observable, becomes a random variable, as this is discussed in Kira and Koch book. When you try to measure some signals in the laboratory, you are expected to have different kinds of outcomes, depending on when you do the measurement. And one way is to look at this picture. Uh, the weaker the signal is, the more random the amplitude of the signal. The randomness of the signal is a consequence or the quantum description of the signal. It cannot be described by just one variable, one number, but it has to be described by a wave function, which actually says that this thing is randomly distributed and so on, okay? So let's talk about uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle is something that we never encounter in the real world or in the classical world. Okay, but in the quantum world, what we have that were observable by like X, the position and P, the momentum, this becomes operators, okay? All the observables becomes operators. And say, if you take a vector, and if this vector is an eigenvector of this operator P hat, you will get a scalar number back, okay? And then if you find the expectation value of this p hat, which is what you would measure in the lab, uh, you will find that this always gives you p, no matter how often you try to do the experiment. If this phi is prepared in the state, 
so that it is always the eigenvector of p hat. You always, when you measure it, get the value of p, okay? This is wonderful, but how often can we prepare a system so that the quantum state is a eigenvector of the operator p hat? Not very often, because you can convince yourself that when two operators do not commute, as is often indicated in this example over here, the p hat and q hat do not commute. Uh, they give you some residual value, which is not zero. You can very easily show that now, if I assume that phi or psi is an eigenvector of both of them, I will get a contradictory answer because if this operates on psi, which is the eigenvector to both of them, if I could break this down, okay, this is the eigenvector of this and this is the eigenvector of that. And then this p hat and q hat would be replaced by the eigenvalues. It's very common in physics notation to denote the eigenvalues by the same symbol. Okay, so p is the eigenvalue of p hat. So I'm going to use the physicist notation, which is to replace this p hat and q hat with scalar values. Okay, you can see that this will give rise to zero because these are scalar numbers which contradicts the original assumption that these two operators do not commute. So having a eigenvector shared by both operators is a contradiction if this is true. Okay, so this is proof of contradiction. You can also understand uncertainty principle in the sense that it is almost impossible to prepare the quantum state that is always in the eigenstate of the operator. Instead, it's a lot easier to prepare a quantum state, which is a linear superposition of the eigenstates of the operator. So let's assume that psi sub n is the eigenstate of this p operator. And if you prepare an arbitrary quantum state, it is going to look more like this, okay? And then if you operate this quantum state with a p hat, and if you change the order of uh, p hat and summation, the p hat operates on psi sub n. And then if you were to take the expectation value of this quantity over here, you will have to multiply the left multiply by psi. And then you have this expression over here. If you go through the algebra, it just back substitute and you have double summation because you have two sides. And then this eigenvectors are orthogonal. As we know, all eigenvectors of a matrix operator are orthogonal if the matrix operator is summation, then I can reduce this to a single summation. And it says that uh, what you do is that when you try to measure this quantity, when psi is not an eigenvector of p hat, you get this quantity. You get the summation of p sub n, the different eigenvalues that comes with this operator, weighted by the component of eigenvectors that this state has, okay? So this is like uh, random averaging because a sub n square has to be equal to one because of the normalization condition, this is a state vector. It has to have unit length. And because it has to have unit length, uh, when you find its inner product with itself, this has to be true. And this is just, another way of saying that the expectation value of a p hat operator is the weighted average of the eigenvalues by the relative frequency at which you find the state to be in. Okay, this is something that we often see in probability theory. So this is like a random average, a random average of all the eigenvalues you have for the system. So if you have two operators, uh, they don't commute and you have all these random averages and they have what we call the spread, okay? I wouldn't go into the detail, but I hope you can study this and realize that uncertainty principle is very intimately related to the commutator of operators, okay? So quantum information science is something that has emerged recently. Uh, actually in 1982 was it confirmed. Before that, physicists were arguing as to 
what quantum information science is and what quantum theory is and so on. And how this comes about is because there were two competing schools of thought, okay? We have a quantum system, like a pendulum is one of them. You have to define a quantum state for this quantum system. And once you know the quantum state of the system, you can find many parameters associated with that quantum state, like expectation values. Expectation values give you the average of the, for instance, in the case of a pendulum, expectation value give you the average of the position and average of the momentum, okay? And physicists and experiments went about the laboratory trying to measure position and momentum. And they found things like this, for instance. The position and the momentum are never definite. They are all random, okay? And every time they went back to the lab and do the experiment again, they get a different outcome. But when you take all the experimental outcomes together, they satisfy what is called the quantum statistics of being the, <coughs> the variance and the expectation value of the quantum system. So there were two schools of thoughts then, is that if you will have a random outcome of an experiment like this, uh, a quantum state is not known until after a measurement. Okay, that this, if you think of this pendulum as going back and forth, it does not go back and forth definitively. It go back and forth with some uncertainty in position. You do not know really where the pendulum is, uh, but you know that it's random because experiments that you keep doing shows that the outcome is random. So there's one school of thought which says that a quantum state is not known until after a measurement. Before you do a measurement, you really know don't have idea as to where the pendulum is going to land up, okay? The pendulum might land up in any one of these positions, okay? You do not know. That's what the Copenhagen School of Thinking is. You do not know where the pendulum is going to be before the measurement, okay? Uh, so Einstein didn't like this kind of concept. Uh, Einstein didn't like Niels Bohr's uh, hypothesis. And he came up with his own uh, hypothesis, he said that, well, God does not play dice. Okay, the Copenhagen School of Interpretation is too random and it's not real. Um, so he posited that there actually is a hidden random variable in the experiment. And this hidden random variable was there. Okay, and that's why the outcome of the experiment is is uh, random, okay? So he claims that even before you do the measurement, it has already been decided by God as to where the outcome would be, okay? So this is called Einstein's hidden variable approach. So there's nothing random about it because you already know the outcome before you do the measurement. So Alan expect A, 1982 confirmed that the Copenhagen School of Interpretation is correct because it can come up with something called the Bell's inequality. Okay, Bell's inequality says that if Neil Bohr's is correct, then the inequality will go the other way if you do the experiment. And if Einstein is correct, then the inequality will be going the other way if you were to do the measurement. And Ellen expect confirmed that Neil's Bohr was correct. Okay, so you have this very strange concept that before you do the measurement, you do not know where the particle is. And only after you perform the measurement would you know where the particle is. I liken this like ghosts and angels that we have as childhood, learn about them that you don't really know where they are. Okay, they can be anywhere in your room. The angel can also be anywhere in your room you do not know, but after you measure, the, or you catch the ghost or you catch the angel, only would you know where they are, okay? So, so this is wonderful. This is wonderful in a sense, philosophically, it says that our karma is not written on our forehead when we were born, 
Okay. So there's one thing. Another thing is that you can hide information in a quantum system. Now, if this is a quantum system, I can hide information as to where the ghost is or where the injury is before the measurement. So information can be hidden incognito before a measurement. And also, if a ghost or an injury can manifest itself in many copies like this, as in this picture over here, you can program or choreograph them to work in parallel for you. Okay, instead of operating on just one part of the machine, machine like if you want to solve the problem of a labyrinth or some optimization problem, you can get this ghost to work on different parts of the labyrinth or the maze for you in parallel. Only after the measurement would you know where the ghost is going to be. Okay, so this gives rise to something called quantum parallelism which is very powerful. That is, if you can make a quantum computer, they can do operations in parallel. Um, you can get computers that are manifestly faster and astronomically much faster than classical computer, which are sequential. Okay? We have parallel computers, but it's not quantum parallelism because in the quantum world, it can generate zillions of copies of this guy or zillions of copies of this guy to get them to work for you and they can work for you in a very powerful manner okay so let's see uh, we discuss how we turn a simple pendulum into a quantum pendulum uh, we say that a simple pendulum is homomorphic to a cavity resonator the oscillation inside the cavity but we can also look at this more macroscopically. And actually Maxwell's equations actually represent an infinite set of copper harmonic oscillator. And that you sort of saw in the transmission line theory. When we did transmission line theory, we see that if we couple LC 10 circuits together, we essentially get a transmission line, which has infinitely many modes. Similarly, if you couple, uh, resonators with springs, they are springs, and you will get many, many modes as they couple to each other. And the wave can travel on this couple of oscillators. And similarly, a wave can travel across this couple uh, LC tank circuit and form a transmission line on which, on which wave can propagate. So you can do this coupling in 1D or coupling in 2D. You can also do this coupling in 3D. And once you look at Maxwell's equations, there's been a set of equations that couple an infinite set of harmonic oscillators together in 2D or 3D or 1D, depending on how you want to write Maxwell's equations. So if you think of Maxwell's equations as a set of copper harmonic oscillators, uh, we would want to be able to do this using Hamiltonian theory. Okay, we would like to be able to derive Maxwell's equations from Hamiltonian theory, uh, like just what we have done. We start with the lone harmonic oscillator and derive the equation of motion for a lone oscillator. And if we have a set of coupled harmonic oscillators, uh, then the positions and the momentum, this is a momentum, this is a position, and we should indicate them with different indices for different oscillators in space. And the general way to write down the Hamiltonian for a set of copper harmonic oscillators is given by this, where it has been uh, denoted or notated by many, many uh, momentum and many, many, many positions. And the positions are coupling them together. For those people who does uh, mechanical engineering, this is not new to you because if you do finite talent analysis, uh, this is called a stiffness matrix. Stiffness matrix holds positions together and give rise to what is called the potential energy. And this is, of course, the kinetic energy since this is the movement of the individual particles. So this is homomorphic to this term and this is homomorphic to this term. But in the 2D or 3D space, this term is quite different. Okay, so let's see how we can derive a wave equation from this coupled 
harmonic oscillators. Okay. Again, we invoke energy conservation, saying that if this is a total Hamiltonian, and when I change my Qs and my Ps, they have to change in tandem in such a way to keep H a constant. And if we go through the argument, also assuming that this oscillators are independent of each other, you can get this thing. And you can get this Hamilton equations of motion by just energy conservation argument alone. Okay. Again, you plug this into the Hamilton equations, you get the equations of motion for Q, and then you get the equations of motion for P. And when you combine these two equations, you get the second order equation for Q, which looks very much like the wave equation because if you think of Q as being a field, P and Q has been fields, not just discrete oscillators. When they become a continuum, they become what we call a field. And then the Kij operator is very much like a linear operator operating on the field. And you can construct this Kij operator in this fashion so they get the Laplacian operator. So if you turn this, back into the continuum world, where i and j are continuous, you get back to the wave equation. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Wave phenomena can be thought of as due to a set of coupled harmonic oscillators, and they couple to each other in such a fashion as to keep the total energy of the system a constant. Okay. So I can do likewise with Maxwell's equations, but the mathematics is a lot more complicated in Maxwell's theory because we have three component field uh, and the algebra is always more complicated if you want to work with Maxwellian theory. But similar argument goes, you have to find the Hamiltonian of the Maxwellian system. And in this case, it's the total energy and the total energy in the E field plus the total energy in the H field. And we use the vector potential approach, okay? Where H and B are related to the curl of A. And then electric field, as you see from the vector scalar potential approach, the, this is actually the electric field, okay? And it's given by this quantity over here, okay? I'm going to make things simpler. I'm going to make things simpler to assume that phi equal to zero, so that I don't have to worry about the scalar potential. Otherwise, I will have to write out more terms, which only confuses you, but not elucidate the concept well to you. So I have this Hamiltonians written in terms of two variables, just like P and Q in the couple harmonic oscillator case, but this is much more complicated. Then I can also write down the Hamilton equations for this set of oscillators. First, I can assume that the oscillators are discrete so that I can do the calculus more easily. And later on, I'm going to make the discrete points into a continuum, okay? And that is obtained by making this J into a continuous variable. That continuous variable will be the position of the oscillators. So J becomes R. And then what you have here, which is ordinary derivatives, you will have to learn how to grapple with functional derivatives. Because this is not a simple uh, number anymore, it's a function. And you have to learn how to do functional derivatives. And it's written up in many of my papers. You can read them, or you can read from textbooks on to how to do functional derivatives. And now if you can swing yourself through all this algebra, this is actually analogous to Hamilton's equations of motion for this Hamiltonian over here. And you can retrieve this vector wave equation, which is just, in this case, Ampere's law. Okay. And then from this equation, which is how we define the vector potential approach, you can get Faraday's law. So you can get Faraday's law and Ampere's law by starting with something and invoke energy conservation. The difference is that Ampere's law and Faraday's law were experimentally motivated during Maxwell's time. It turns out that you can now derive these equations by using energy conservation arguments, okay? So there's something that is often said 
in quantum theory, uh, I would not be complete until after I've introduced to you what the Schrodinger picture is and what the Heisenberg picture is and what the Hamilton equations are, okay? So if I have Schrodinger equation, which I told you, if you are control theorist, you know how to solve Schrodinger equation in closed form. Okay, it looks something like this because that Hamiltonian is independent of time. So if you have a quantum state, the expectation value of an operator with respect to that quantum state is given by this equation over here. But it turns out that there are two ways to write this equation because of this equation over here. I can write the quantum state raw, like it is this way. I can use this equation and substitute in for the quantum state and get this over here, okay, where this is time independent, but the piece in the center now is time dependent. Whereas previously, this piece in the center is independent of time. So I switch from what is called the Schrodinger picture, this line over here, to the Heisenberg picture. And so this is the operator in Schrodinger picture. And in Heisenberg picture would be represented like this because I just switch the role of the Hamiltonian and so on, okay? So in the Heisenberg picture, an operator looks something like this. And you can differentiate this operator with respect to time. Whereas in the Schrodinger picture, the operator is independent of time. So if you differentiate this operator with respect to time, it's supposed to go to zero, okay? So what happens then is that if you were to differentiate this Heisenberg picture operator, uh, you will get two terms, this simple mathematical algebra. I think all of you know how to do that. And this can be written as a commutator, okay? And as a small aside, when you apply this Heisenberg equation of motion to this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, annihilation operator, you can solve it quite easily. You find that the annihilation operator has to have time dependence of this form, okay? And then you can easily show that, well, using this equation, the third line that we have derived, that the equation of motion for the momentum operator is given by this, which is just a straightforward application of this. And then the, Position operator is given by this. These are called the Heisenberg equations of motion because we're in the Heisenberg picture, okay? But what is very wonderful is that this commutator can be written in a succinct manner that I have no time to go into the details, but you can read my papers on them. You can read some of the people's papers on them that this commutator can be written succinctly as this, a differentiation with respect to the operator Q hat. And this commutator can also be written succinctly as this. So I can replace the right-hand side with something simpler, in my opinion, simpler. So if I do that to these two equations, well, I can get equations that are very simply or simple looking. And you can see that they are very similar or strikingly similar to the classical Hamilton equation, okay? Hamilton died in 1865. I think he would be rolling happily in his grave that he knows that his equation can be also written in the quantum world. The quantum rendition of Hamilton equations are this over here, okay? Um, so let's see. So, the thing is that we have this picture now that is starting to form in your mind that if you have a classical wall, we can have classical Hamilton equation. We can have Hamilton equation applied to the Maxwellian, classical Maxwellian field. We can get these equations. And because of the homomorphism between classical and quantum, which is what is expressed in this slide over here. If you figure out how to do something in the classical world, in the quantum world, you just elevate everything to be operators and do the same thing in the quantum world. So I'm trying to emphasize this. In the quantum world, take whatever you have learned in the classical world, replace all those operators, all those 
numbers with operators. And you can get these equations of motion in the, in the quantum world, okay? But there's one catch. I never taught you how to take the derivative of the operator with respect to the operator. In control theory, you might have learned that, but I, I doubt not, okay? I doubt not in electrical engineering courses that you have learned that. So if you want to figure out how to differentiate a function of an operator with respect to operator, you just have to read this line carefully. I don't have time to go through this line, but it's in my paper, okay? So what I'm trying to get at is that if you start now with the quantum Hamiltonian, you can do all this calculus in the quantum world with operators. You arrive at what I call the quantum Maxwell's equations, okay? Quantum Maxwell's equations and they look strikingly similar to the classical Maxwell's equations. They look something like this. Okay, where each hat is given by this. So, so, so very good. So we have something, um, we know how to elevate something from the classical world to the quantum world, okay? And what can we do with this knowledge? Well, the, the thing that we know how to do or deal with in this knowledge is that, um, let me see. So we can write down a field classically we know how to do that if you have taken EC604, a sinusoidal field can be written in this manner. This is just another way of writing phases. This is complex conjugation. And this is the mathematicians or the physicist's way of writing a phase. They never call this phaser technique, but we engineers like to call that phaser technique. And you can find, of course, the electric field from this and is also given by this. And it will be interesting to ask yourself, if this is a plane wave propagating, it will give rise to energy flow or energy flux flow, but there should be a photon flux associated with this plane wave, okay? So there will be a bunch of photons riding on the plane wave mode. That's what I like to emphasize. And if you express this in terms of plane wave energy, or energy density, we all know how to do that. By this time of the course, we know that the energy density in the plane wave mode is given by this. And if I write in terms of the vector potential A is given by this, this must be somewhat equal to the total number of photons times the energy carried by each photon times the velocity of the photons, okay, which is this. So these two must be equal. So if I want to give any meaning to this A sub zero in terms of photon numbers, et cetera, I can say that I have to write my A sub zero in this manner. I have replaced N with uh, N over V. Okay, N over V is, has replaced my N. And so if I give my A zero a complex amplitude like this, Okay, at least it has a photon number in it. It's not quantum yet. <coughs> I have not done anything to make quantum. I make it pseudo quantum, or sometimes we call it a semi-classical view of the world. I'm trying to factor in some quantum effects into my classical expression. So because of that, I can rewrite these classical expressions so that it has some fringe of quantum phenomenon in there. And I like to point out to you that in the physics world, we don't use phases notation like this, but we write this in terms of this. We also write this in terms of positive frequency and negative frequency. Okay? You probably learned somewhere that for every positive frequency, there's a negative frequency. The negative frequency always gives you the complex conjugation of the positive frequency. So if I were to rewrite this expression, I can write this expression in this manner, okay? And the total plane wave energy density is just the product of these two terms. Itself is this complex conjugation, 
give me the plane wave density. And this gives me this number. All these phases will go away. Okay, all these phases will go away because these two are complex conjugation of each other. And this is very pleasing. At least my pseudo uh, quantum theory gives me something that has the VSH of a photon flux. Okay, NH bar omega divided by V divided by omega square. Okay, omega square was there because I define things that way. So right now I have to bring in the quantum wall. Okay, how do I bring in the quantum wall without doing completely garbage? And if you read most textbooks, this is a very long exercise. I'm trying to motivate this by physical insight rather than going through the mathematical derivation. I'm going to say that the field operators that we have alluded to can be obtained by taking whatever classical field that we have in the previous slide, okay? Replace this with the annihilation operator. <clears throat> and then the other one would be just the complex conjugation. But since these are now operators, they are like matrix operators, I have to replace complex conjugation with permission conjugation. So one way of writing this operator, which is a field operator now, is that it can be written in this manner. And then the positive frequency part is given by this expression. And then the negative frequency part is given by this expression. So I have elevated successfully from a scalar quantity into a quantum operator, which is called a quantum observable. And did I do nonsense here? So the, the Derivation from first principle is too long. I don't have time to talk about that. So I'm, I motivated this expression and I want to go through pre sanity checks to see if this expression is sane or insane. Okay. The first question that I ask is that the quantum field that I have written down has to be a solution to quantum Maxwell's equations. Okay, you know what quantum Maxwell's equations are? They look very much like the classical Maxwell's equations, except for the fact that all the fields becomes operators. Okay, I think we had that a few slides back. All the fields becomes operators. That is what quantum Maxwell's equations are. And does this field operator have this uh, randomness hypothesis that this now becomes a random variable? Is this the operator representation of a random variable, because I know because this a hat is a lowering operator. It's not just a simple number, but there is a matrix operator associated with that. And once you have a matrix operator, all you can have is um, average value by taking its expectation value. You can also look for the standard deviation and, and the variance of this operator for this if you go back and check, okay, this field is actually random. This can be a representation of a random field because of the fact that this is not defined unless I also define a quantum state associated with that, okay, which is what I alluded to in the beginning that um, where did I allude to? Okay, you have to, to define a quantum state with any operators that you define. Okay, here, you have to define a quantum state with respect to any operators that you encounter in a quantum world. Okay, so we have introduced an operator which is a field operator. So in order to make sense of it, you have to define a quantum state associated with this field operator. And this field operator is related to the annihilation operator, okay? And another very important thing is that there is a quantum state equation that has to be satisfied. I don't have time to go into that, but I can put in the lecture note. And that quantum state equation looks something like this, okay? You take the Hamiltonian that you have found, 
for instance, uh, the hamiltonian that you found in this thing. And then this equation has to be satisfied and that's called a quantum state equation. And you can check that if I were to plug all these fields that I have into the Hamiltonian that I have derived and that the quantum state equation is satisfied, okay? So I, I did three sanity checks and know that I'm along the right path. Of course, I'm cheating because I knew the answer before I introduced this expressions to you, but deriving these expressions for first, uh, from first principle is too long. We don't have time to discuss that, okay? So what happens if the field now represents an arbitrary polarization? I know classically, uh, I would have this looking very much like classical Maxwell's equation. Uh, the only thing that I need to do for quantum Maxwell's equations is that this have, has to become a, an operator and I can replace that operator as a very good guess with this operator plus its summation conjugate. Of course, this is cheating because I knew the answer beforehand. I'm just trying to convince you that this is something that makes sense. It's not complete nonsense. Okay. so. So you have this operator equations, and then they have different polarizations. And then this is annihilation operator, this is the creation operator and so on. So the plus frequency is given by this and the negative frequencies are given by that. Well, something that we never talked about is that these are operators. They have to be operating on a quantum state. So we like to think of this Field operators now being associated with photons writing on the plane wave. Okay, they have photons writing on electromagnetic field modes. And one way to define the state of the photon, a one photon state, is to use this notation over here. This says that a one photon state is a linear superposition of a photon state like this. And this is a different way of writing the fo one photon state. The thing to remember is that there are two polarizations here. So one is horizontally polarized and the other one is vertically polarized. So we, we actually have two oscillators. One oscillator is corresponding to horizontal polarization. The other one corresponding to vertical polarization. And the photon that we have can be associated with the vertical polarization with no photon in the horizontal polarization or one photon in the vertical oscillator, no photon in the horizontal oscillator or vice versa, okay? So, but I only allow one photon to be present in this quantum state that I have written down here, uh, which means that um, the quantum state or the one photon state can be written as a linear superposition of two states, okay? And one of the things that you learn in quantum theory is that any quantum state can be written as linear superposition of different quantum states. And these are two possible quantum states that can describe the state of these photons uh, in this system. And since this is, a, state vector that describes our probability amplitude. So it's necessary to have AB squared plus H, H squared to be equal to one. And oftentimes the zero photon number state is ignored. So usually most people would just write it like this. So what we have here is that the photon is jumping back and forth. There's only one of them, okay? The photon is jumping back and forth between the horizontal polarization and a vertical polarization. This is how the both uh, one photon state is, is uh, to be looked at. Okay? It should be given a probabilistic interpretation as well. And it also should be given the quantum interpretation, which is that you do not know where the photon is before you do the measurement. The photon is just jumping back and forth within these two polarizations, okay? Um, this is wonderful. 
This is wonderful for quantum, uh, quantum communication, which is indicated over here. So I can have a photon going through a polarizer. You do not know whether the photon is going to be horizontally polarized or vertically polarized or linear superposition of that two states, okay? Only after the measurement would you know if the photon is horizontally polarized or vertically polarized, which means that this is a great way to hide information. Okay, this is a great way to hide information. And this is kind of described uh, in David Miller's book and also in my lecture notes that quantum mechanics makes simple as to how you can use randomness of the polarization that the photon does not commit itself to one of the two polarizations, horizontal or vertical before the measurement. Only after the measurement do you know where the photon is. Okay, this is wonderful stuff. So you can write this one photon states and do different kinds of measurements. Okay, so I essentially try to cramp a lot of knowledge into you in just one simple lecture. Okay, so a quantum observable become a random variable. And this area, as far as I know, is rather thin on knowledge base. I'm sure that if you go and look up any books and try to read them, you will be swamped or snowed because they don't explain things really well. Okay, the quantum advantage is very important in quantum communication, quantum computers, as I described to you, the quantum parallelism as to how uh, things are. Another area is quantum sensor or quantum sensing. We never talked about entangled photon states or entangled quantum states. And entangled uh, quantum states are highly correlated. Okay, even though when the two photons have traveled to be miles apart, you can actually uh, still sense the entanglement, which is something that nobody could understand, okay? And I hope that this course will stimulate more research in this area. And topics that I don't have time to, to cover in the introduction is quantum entanglement, light squeezing, and quantum parallelism, okay? And these are the papers that we have written. Okay, are there any questions uh, for kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, quantum theory of light. Cannot be, like, it cannot be crystal clear. I'm sure that you have lots of questions. And I'm sure that I did not convince you in just one lecture. You probably have to go back and read the lecture notes in order to convince yourself of many of the nuances that we have in quantum theory. So there's a lot of stuff in this lecture that's not in the online lecture notes. Um, are those gonna be updated with a lot of the things in this presentation? Yes, uh, I actually revamped this lecture, this chapter. Okay, I revamped this chapter because I felt that what I wrote the first time around has too little content. I think if you are very curious about quantum technology and quantum theory of flight, what I wrote uh, the first time around would not vet your appetite. Okay, but this one would, you know, forcing knowledge to you like a, like a, what they call a fire hose, fire hydrant or, or something, feeding you with a fire hydrant. There are lots of information in here that I don't believe you can digest very easily. Okay. But go back and read the lecture notes and ask questions if you have any. Uh, it takes a long time for things to digest and it takes a long time for things to sink in. Okay. And to me, this is like Zen Buddhism. I don't know if any one of you think about Zen Buddhism, you really have to think about some of these ideas a lot before it, uh, it uh, percolates through your system, okay?
So any other questions that you may have? I have one question. <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, a little bit in your presentation about this, but I just wanted to ask uh, from the research that you've done in your career, what, what research have you done that involves uh, these, these quantum technologies and, and this theory we talked about today? Yeah, I haven't done very much. Uh, I have done some cosmic force calculations and I work with Dr. Na on uh, how to do some of this, uh, essentially applying computational electromagnetics method in solving quantum Maxwell's equations uh, for more complicated geometry. And we have done, for instance, uh, computational codes that can simulate the home ohm mandel effect. And Dr. Na has also been able to show the non-local dispersion cancellation, which is something very weird in the classical world. Okay, two photons are correlated if they're entangled. And you can use the knowledge in one photon to cancel the dispersion errors that might come about uh, from the second photon, okay? And Dr. Andy Weiner at Purdue is also doing a lot of very neat things in his lab if you want to work in this area, one area to work, one person to work with Dr. Andy Weiner. He talks about quantum uh, communications and quantum entanglement as to how you use that to improve um, uh, quantum uh, communication. And I have another student, uh, Dr. Ross. He just joined Purdue University. He is looking into using uh, computational electromagnetics to combine with circuit QED to model some of the things that you have in, um, in things like transmons, qubits, and things like that, which I think is very important. I feel that because this field is relatively young, um, people did not believe this concept until after 1982. And few people solve quantum Maxwell's equations. Everybody solves classical Maxwell's equations, okay? So, so hopefully, if we have enough knowledge base, I hope if we have enough knowledge base, we can design a quantum computer like we have designed a classical computer, okay? Because uh, right now, they are still grappling with uh, quantum noise, quantum noise, in the quantum processes that they're working with because of the inherent nature of randomness in quantum theory. How can we engineer things that we can overcome this quantum randomness and hence improve on the signal to noise ratio? I do not know, okay? That is to me an important area of research. Another very important area of research, I think is the ability to, uh, to detect uh, microwave photons, okay? Uh, because if you look at electromagnetic spectrum in remote sensing, the only spectrum that can look through the atmosphere is microwave photons. If you look at the remote sensing picture of the earth surface using optical signals and then the same earth surface using microwave signals, they look vastly different because Microwave photons can go through cloud, cloud covers. They can look through cloud covers, okay? And you can see wonderful things on the Earth surface using microwave photons. But detecting a microwave photon is a challenge because you probably know that the energy quantization is proportional to h bar omega. The energy of a photon is h bar omega. As I say early in the course, and H bar is a very small number. It's something like six times 10 to the minus 34 or 32. So for microwave frequency, this quantization energy is extremely weak. And hence microwave photons are very hard to detect. But I think people are clever. People are ingenious. If you put a whole bunch of scientists together, I'm sure that they will come up with some ideas on how to detect microwave photons, which to me, has tremendous impact 
even the present um, present quantum computers that have been designed so far all use microwave photons. The reason is because it is a lot easier to engineer components in microwave wavelength than to engineer optical components. The only disadvantage is that when you work with microwave, because of the weakness of this signal, you have to do cryogenics, okay? You have to cool, super cool your room so that there's no thermal noise involved. Uh, so if you work with optical photons, then there are less things that you can engineer uh, because things come so small in the component size. Unless you do, do only passive components, like what they did in China with the boson sampler. That was completely a linear passive kind of thing. And they were able to get quantum parallelism on the boson sampler. They give rise to phenomenal speed up of some of the uh, computations. Any any other questions? I, as I say, there's lots of knowledge in this field. Okay, something that you will probably take months to digest uh, if you really want to understand this field. Okay, go back and read about it and try to learn as much. And as I say, it's like Zen Buddhism. You probably never get the epiphany moment until after sitting down for many months to think about it. Is that you will get the aha moment. Aha, I got this. Aha, I got that. Okay. So, so I let you go. Thank you. Okay, thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.